Pirillo, president of Yale Club of Italy, who will be leading the talk, and Diana Wade, uh, uh, Barnard and School of Art, who will be um, uh, co-hosting. So we in, it's indeed like Yale and Columbia because uh, Professor uh, Inzorf studied and te was teaching at Yale and at Columbia, and we have both of students, uh, one from Yale and from from Columbia. Yeah, thank you, and over to you. Well, first of all, thank you, Selby, for uh, taking uh, uh, the lead on this one and and for agreeing to to do, organize this this joint event. Uh, thank you also, uh, Diana, for uh, taking care of the technical side of this uh, uh, event, since both uh, Selby and I are in two areas where uh, perhaps the reception is not the best, and and uh, we need somebody uh, with some serious internet uh, to to get this thing going. Um, I'm I'm just going to be very brief because uh, Annette has wonderful things to tell us uh, about movies, as she always does. Um, I just want to tell a little story. First of all, um, I'm an economics and political science double major, and the only person at Yale I took two classes with is Annette, uh, because they were so fantastic. And how did I uh, discover Annette? Well, I guess it has to do a lot with uh, the, the excessive testosterone of, of an, a 19-year-old at Yale, uh, who one day walking, uh, I think it's Wall Street that, that divides Brantford from the old campus, saw a very pretty girl and decided to follow her uh, and see where she was going. And well, she ended up being in, uh, uh, you know, going to Annette's uh, French fiction and film class, which um, I decided to, to, to listen to the introduction. And I said, wow, this sounds interesting. After all, um, uh, I didn't get the girl, but I, I did discover Annette, which was, was you know, certainly a lot better uh, since um, at the, in, during those days, uh, relationships uh, were, were rather uh, brief. And, and, <laughs> and, and <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to say that, that uh, Annette, has, you know, whilst I haven't seen her since uh, university, has remained in my mind a lot longer than any of the girls that I have ever uh, dealt with at, at Yale or, or even afterwards. So um, I took that class uh, where I was required to write um, as, a, as a final paper a um, script. Uh, and, and then after that, I took the American film history class, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, AKA Monday afternoon at the movies or something like that. Uh, <laughs> Monday evenings at the movies, but it was, it was you know, fantastic. And it made me understand movies uh, much better than I used to. And it made me love movies. Uh, I'm still today a movie buff and I still look at a movie uh, in ways that, you know, none of those around me uh, look at. Uh, I, I, I discover things which uh, only thanks to Annette, I could have really uh, found out. Um, I'm glad that there's also a more recent uh, student, Diana uh, of, of Annette in, in a different university. Uh, your gain is our loss. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, I, I'm just so happy that I could see Annette again, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to more. So over to you, Annette. Um, I'm back in class. Uh, I'm very grateful for your exceedingly kind recollections. <laughs> and uh, for me, there's been a beautiful continuity between the many years that I taught at Yale right after, even during my PhD studies in English and American literature, I was teaching film, and then Columbia, um, where I was able to go deeper and further than Yale, simply because Yale had a beginning film studies program, but nothing elaborated, whereas Columbia already had the film program of the School of the Arts, which is where I teach. And I was chairman from 1990 to 95 of the graduate program and simultaneously, but for 27 years, director of undergraduate film studies at Columbia. So my primary identity has continued to be that of an educator. Um, today, I was gonna focus a little bit on aspects of what I consider to be crucial to film study, namely looking closely and listening very deeply 
to the opening sequences of films in order to enter into the world of the motion picture in a deeper and more appreciative way. And I was going to focus on the, the visual, the gradual reveal, not something that, you know, montage hitting you the way people with ADD increasingly are led to, um, well, actually, I think ADD characterizes our attention span in general for most of us. Um, but the gradual reveal or long take refuse that. And secondly, the musical score. In my classes at Columbia, I favor movies that begin with that slow introduction, because when directors don't show us everything at the beginning, they do lead us to enter more actively into the scene. And this is the case with the five motion pictures that I want to deal with today. They all happen to be from the 1970s, one of the most vibrant decades in the history of cinema. I hope to focus on The Conformist, The Hourglass Sanatorium from Poland, Aguirre, The Wrath of God from Germany, Apocalypse Now, and Taxi Driver, so that you have one Italian, one Polish, one German, and two from the United States. Now, except for the last, all are adaptations from literary sources. So I hope to therefore explore as well the process of adaptation and especially how the musical score often assumes the voice of a novel's narrator. We know that some movies start with that stylized prologue that's not really part of the action, but sets a tone or introduces a theme, as in Apocalypse Now or Raging Bull. Both films truly have overtures in that the music figures prominently, whether Italian opera or a song by the doors. Then what happens when a film replaces the traditional establishing shot with a mobile gaze that keeps redefining focus? This undermines our complacency as moviegoers. Directors like Bernardo Bertolucci and Wojciech Haas, they keep us actively engaged in the unfolding of a tale. Their openings make us aware not only of what is being revealed, but what remains concealed. Exploiting the resources of camera narration, they draw us into a mystery. Now, I teach The Conformist, which was made in 1970, every year. Because Bertolucci tells the story through uniquely cinematic means. Instead of falling back on that literary crutch of voiceover narration, he exploits expressive camera angle and movement, as well as color, visual texture, contrapuntal editing, and music. The author of the source novel is an Italian, Alberto Moravia, whose work has been adapted by other major directors as well. Vittorio De Sica filmed his Two Women, and Jean-Luc Godard turned his novel Ghost at Noon into Contempt. If Moravia's novel unfolds chronologically via third-person narration, the conformist as movie moves back in time through the subjectivity of its protagonist. I got to hear Bertolucci speaking in 1995 at Lincoln Center during a retrospective of his work. And I love what he said about adapting The Conformist, and I'm going to quote from him. I was flying over Moravia's pages as if they were a landscape, words like architecture, unquote, unquote. So Bertolucci's flashback structure transforms the book into the first person tale of Marcello, played by Jean-Louis Trintignant. He joins the secret police in Italy, partly to atone for what he thinks was a homosexual flirtation and murder in his youth. Marcello is assigned to kill his former professor Quadri, a leftist who's in exile in Paris, while Marcello's on his honeymoon there. But when he finds his old teacher, he is deeply attracted to Quadri's wife, Anna, played by Dominique Sanda, who seems drawn to both Marcello and his bride, Julia. The day of the assassination is the point of departure for a film about memory and desire. The opening sequence prepares the viewer for a vigorous engagement with the entire movie. And I'm going to ask Diana to show the clip which is the opening sequence of The Conformist.
I'm not sure that we're hearing the music. I, I'm sorry, let me just do this again. Um, I'm just gonna start. Yeah, because I don't think, the music yeah. does not enter with the first frame, but by the time okay. We have the neon yeah. marquee. It should be audible. Okay. okay. Are you hearing the music? Sadly not. Oh, yes. Now we got it. Okay, we can cut here. So I, I realized that, you know, the irony that I, wa I want so badly for people to appreciate the artistry visually and musically at when we're watching the screen sharing of clips, the degradation is impossible to avoid. It's like what it's like looking at a Xerox copy of a painting from a museum. <laughs> so bear with us. I'm, I'm just kind of hoping that most of you have seen The Conformist before, that you remember not just the lushness, but the mobility of the camera. Here, you know, when you're watching it with shared screen, it's like it's choppy, even though it's one take. Um, so I, I do apologize for that. Well, during the credits, I think you realize that intermittent light makes us aware that we can't see everything. We discern a man sitting on a bed, but at moments the screen is black. The light, an evocative red, turns out to be a reflection from a neon movie marquee across the street. The title is La Vie est à nous, Life Belongs to Us, Jean Renoir's film of 1936. <laughs> For those who are familiar with his celebration of the French Communist Party on screen, the action of the conformist unfolds in Paris before World War II and under the sign of self-conscious homage. We hear that lyrical melody of Georges Delroux's score as the man on the bed, fully dressed, 
becomes more visible. This will turn out to be Marcello, who is first glimpsed with his arm over his eyes. Bertolucci thus introduces this, the theme of sight, which will be developed throughout the film. Did you notice how when he gets up, the camera just moves back a bit to reveal a hotel room, as well as another person in the bed, naked and face down. Marcello approaches a bag in the left foreground and removes a gun in front of a mirror. The close-up of his hand holding the weapon separates it from the rest of his body, just as subsequent scenes will display his discomfort with a revolver. Is the other body we glimpsed alive or dead? A sleepy moan suggests alive, male or female. Sexual ambiguity, which is one of the film's prominent themes, is thus introduced. Marcello removes his hat from a female posterior and covers the woman with a sheet. We later learn that this is his bride, Julia. The first scene suggests that she's merely a physical prop for him and that Marcello is not comfortable with nudity. This impression is later confirmed in a flashback where he visits his mother and covers her undressed body with a sheet. Throughout this opening sequence, Bertolucci acknowledges how he will reveal information only gradually, not allowing us to take anything for granted. We cannot ignore the indispensable contribution in this regard of cinematographer Vittorio Storaro, who collaborated with Bertolucci on subsequent films like The Last Emperor, as well as with Coppola for Apocalypse Now, Warren Beatty on Reds, and this is uh, the 40th anniversary of Beatty's magnificent film, and Carlo Saura for a series of vibrant films about dance. Now, in the next scene that we're not going to watch because the quality just isn't good enough, Marcello goes out to the dawn light accompanied by ten strings waiting for a car. And again, Bertolucci withholds information, forcing us to watch more attentively. We do not see who is speaking next to him. We realize only afterwards that Marcello is seated beside, beside a chauffeur named Manganiello, a tough, cigar-smoking, Italian-speaking fascist. As they speed through this wintry landscape on an October day of 1938, Flashbacks permit entry into Marcello's mind with a stream of consciousness narration. Flashbacks within flashbacks make the conformist a cinematic poem with internal rhymes. We keep moving from past to present, not because Bertolucci likes playing with celluloid, but because he sees past and present as inseparable. Marcello is intent on becoming a conformist and a fascist in the present out of fear of what he might have done as a youth in the past. Sexual deviance and the possibility of being a killer exist both then and now. Marcello understands the connection between time periods only at the very end of the film, after a parade celebrates the downfall of Mussolini. He hears the voice of Lino. That was the chauffeur in his youth. He realizes that he did not murder the gay man who was seducing him. The Conformist is therefore on a secondary level, a film about seeing. Its concentration on voyeurism leads to larger themes of blindness versus lucidity, shadows versus reality and fascism versus individual morality. The theme of sight, which is introduced by the intermittent light of that first shot, is developed in a few key scenes. And I'm just going to mention, in the hope that you'll see The Conformist in the near future, there's a flashback to a radio station where Marcello is with his friend Italo, a fascist who happens to be blind. For Bertolucci, fascism equals blindness. And Mar Marcello sees only reflections rather than reality. When he later visits Quadri in Paris, they reenact Plato's myth of the cave, the famous parable about prisoners who are limited to perceiving reflections. 
That scene ends with Professor Quadri opening a window shade, letting in the light, and erasing the shadows. The anti-fascist is thus the agent of illumination. And I'm going to quote Bertolucci about this. He said, shooting the Plato scene, I had the feeling that the cave was talking about the invention of cinema. Plato, not Lumiere, is the inventor of the cinema. That exciting morning in 1970, we were still in the 1960s with the idea that a movie not only had to tell a story, but investigate and analyze cinema with the revolution made by the new wave, especially Godard, unquote. So the lighting throughout the film is self-consciously dramatic, often intermittent, besides the opening we just watched, when Marcello is in a Chinese restaurant, in the back, he hits a swinging overhead lamp that casts momentary light. It expresses his wavering resolve about killing quality. And it also suggests that Bertolucci is proposing visually that what we see, it can only be in terms of what is illuminated for us. This is true not merely for movie viewers, but for citizens of any state. Dictatorships don't reveal everything to the people. In interviews, he even admitted that he might be a fascist filmmaker because he manipulates everything we see. Is there not a form of fascism in the tyranny of our own expectations? but there's also great freedom in watching The Conformist. We're invited into active participation because we have to stay on our cinematic toes. Many shots are ambiguous, their meaning becoming apparent only in retrospect. Bertolucci adds to Moravia's story a few scenes of witnessing or peeping, choices that serve to make us aware of our own voyeurism. Bertolucci uses breathtaking cinematography, sensuous music, and deft montage, turning the verbal narration into an exploration of sexuality, politics, and cinematic style. We enter the tense rushes of Marcello's mind through flashbacks, moving from past to present and from fascism to freedom. Now, for me, one of the most unsettling film openings is in a movie called The Hourglass Sanatorium, which I'm going to guess is not familiar to any of you. The director, Wojciech Haas, he made only 13 features, <clears throat> and he devoted the last 14 years of his life to being a professor and then dean of the famed Lodge Film School. When I interviewed some of his former students and colleagues in 2014, because I was writing a book about Haas's work, they confirmed his singular att attention to detail, beginning with an often elaborate hand-drawn storyboard. Even if he was often out of fashion, as well as political favor, he was an inspirational master of cinematic language. Haas's movies struck a deep chord with admirers such as Jerry Garcia of The Grateful Dead. He claimed that the Saragossa manuscript was his favorite film, and that was another Haas movie. Coppola, Buñuel, David Lynch, and Martin Scorsese, who programmed two of Haas's features in a traveling exhibition of Polish cinema back in 2014. Haas never joined the Communist Party, he often eluded censorship by adapting novels set in the past and by refusing to direct contemporary films. He was a prose poet of solitude and alienation, a formalist rather than a realist. He crafted stories that explore yearning, weakness, and loss. It took him five years to make the Hourglass Sanatorium, also known as the Sand Class which was released in 1973. He wrote the screenplay adapting Bruno Schultz's story collection, <coughs> excuse me, called Sanatorium Under the Sign of the Hourglass, published in 1937. Schultz, a Jewish writer who became known as Poland's Kafka, he was murdered by a Gestapo officer in 1942 for stepping outside the ghetto of his Galician town. 
Given the film's striking and pervasive Jewish imagery, it can be seen as a phantasmagoric layering of at least three time frames. The pre-World War II past of Schultz's stories, the Holocaust, and a post-war Poland haunted by the ghosts of dead Jews. Visually and orally, <clears throat> Haas interweaves the theme of time. The sand glass is disorienting. It's less a linear narrative than a composition of internal rhymes, stories within stories containing the logic of dreams. We're going to be moving through dreamscapes of dilapidation where a constantly tracking camera conveys a rich darkness. And given the prevalence of a self-conscious low angle camera, as well as dissonant sound design, meaning emerges through surreal visual and oral juxtapositions. So Diana, let's give it a try one more time with the clip from the Hourglass Sanatorium. I hope that some degree of its fluidity will come through. Thank you. 
Już dojeżdżamy. Jak tam dojść? Sam odnajdziesz drogę. Bez niczyjej pomocy. Actually, we can we, we can cut it here. Thanks. Again, I <laughs> this is not the way that you should be hearing or seeing the Hourglass Sanatorium. So apologies. I'm just going to say a few words about this. You probably noticed how it begins with an exterior shot of a raven flying left in slow motion. The camera is actually tracking right. In addition to this lateral movement, the camera pulls back, emphasizing depth as it reveals that our perspective has been through a train window framing the sky. It moves further back to show the train's pervasive darkness and decay. From an extreme low angle perspective, we see religious Jews who are seated, but it's not clear if they are sleeping or dead. We glimpse a child on the bottom left of the frame, an empty wheelchair on the right, a bare-breasted woman sleeping, and a clock. The film's action begins only when Joseph is awakened by a blind conductor who announces the next stop as his destination. This opening introduces key elements that will be developed throughout the film. The wide angle lens prepa prepares for the perspective of a child while reminding us that we are an audience looking up at the screen and subject to entrapment because the ceiling bears down on characters. In addition, that distorting lens invokes a subterranean or hellish perspective. The train of the opening sequence connotes something darker in 1973 than in 1937. It carries Jews who look almost dead and is therefore a prophetic image of the image of transport used by the Nazis to move their victims to concentration camps. The crumbling space of the sanatorium in which most of the action is contained, it's really a cemetery. And with Jews depicted mainly as ghosts, it conveys the sense of Poland as the graveyard of an entire people. And it's really enhanced by the atonal music of Jerzy Maksymiuk, who collaborated with Haas on three other films, but I don't think you were able to get much of a taste of that from the screen sharing experience. It is not surprising that Polish authorities did not appreciate the sand glass. Some were uncomfortable with Wojciech Haas's sympathetic foregrounding of Jewish life a mere few years after the government's 1968 expulsion of approximately 30,000 Polish Jews. Others interpreted the decaying sanatorium as a symbol of the rundown institutions in Poland. Although Haas was not officially permitted to submit the sand glass to the 1973 Cannes Film Festival, a print was smuggled to France where the jury, presided by Ingrid Bergman, awarded it the jury prize. Wojciech Haas was not able to make a film for another 10 years. Also in 1972, Werner Herzog was directing Aguirre, The Wrath of God, a movie of lyrical as well as terrifying poetry. It, we move from Wojciech Haas's, um, what I would call more horizontal, um, axis of vision to the vertical axis of Herzog's German fever dream. He recreates a doomed expedition of the year 1560 into the Peruvian jungle by a conquistador who was searching for the lost city of El Dorado, city of gold. It is based on the actual diary of a monk named Gaspar, Gaspar de Carvajal. 
In the opening sequence, the images and music express a physical descent and perhaps a metaphysical one through a primeval natural landscape. Diana, I'm going to try to share my own screen because what I'm thinking is that okay. maybe, maybe, maybe I will be able, I have no idea if this, if this will be the case, but um, let me see, sorry. Um, one second, I just realized I have to do share screen. Aha, uh -huh. share screen. Oh, I'm just, I'm, I don't think I can do screen sharing. Sorry, I, I'm not allowed to do it from this. All right, go ahead. Let's just try with Agira then. Um, if it works, we'll keep watching and listening. And if not, we'll just cut the short shorter. Uh, we'll cut the clip shorter. Um, okay. Perhaps if Selby allows uh, uh, Annette to yeah, share, I, then I, that's I, possible. Oh, I mean, I I'm willing to give it a try. By the way, it may sound and look exactly the same. Oh, yeah, I, I can do it. It may sound and look exactly the same. But wait, uh, now what I've got on my desktop is actually this Zoom session. I need to get this back up here. One second. Oh, dear. I may actually, I don't think I'm able to do it because... Let me... Let me do if it's the same links. So yeah, it's the same. I actually, I, I can't do it from here. Sorry. Well, let me, let me then to do it. Wait. Okay. Okay. Am Weihnachtstag des Jahres 1560 erreichten wir die letzte Passhöhe des Andengebirges und sahen zum ersten Mal in den gelobten Urwald hinab. Am Morgen las ich die Messe, dann stiegen wir durch die Wolken hinab. can stop it here because you it, fortunately the quality was a tad better you can get a sense of the images of the sound and the fact that um Herzog's slow pace allows each image to sink in during this very elemental introduction anchored by the mountain or earth we see the sky above 
the mist to the right invoking water, and finally fire after the crash of a cannon. And the very shape of the mountain descent will later be rhymed by a lightning bolt, which could be interpreted as the wrath of God. This locale in Peru is the most famous icon of Inca civilization. The physical effort of the actors making their way down the mountain fulfills what the filmmaker Barbe Schroeder once said on a Telluride Film Festival panel that I was moderating, that all movies are documentaries in the sense that they record real people doing real things. Here we see animals in addition to the indigenous people and the European men in heavy breastplates making that arduous descent. And it's the tiny beings coming down the mountain of Aguirre, it's accompanied by the music, the hypnotic music of Florian Frick using the name Popol Vu, P-O-P-O-L, V-U-H from the Mayan creation myth. And Herzog actually explained to Roger Ebert um, that this was a strange instrument that they called a choir organ. It had uh, inside it three dozen different tapes running parallel to each other playing at the same time so that it sounds simultaneously like a human choir and artificial and eerie. His passion for music is evident in the hypnotic soundtracks of his movies, which often rise and fall alongside a character's ascent or descent. Whether it's a mountain climber in the dark glow of the mountains, a ski jumper in the great ecstasy of the sculptor Steiner, Strozek on a stalled ski lift, or his character Fitzcarraldo pulling a boat up impossibly steep slopes, the scores of his films express a longing for flight or transcendence. It's no surprise that Herzog went on to direct opera. The voiceover narration of the monk provides another narrative layer in Aguirre, bringing Herzog's tale back to oral traditions. His voice will turn out to be deceptive. The narrator seems to be killed before the end of the film. Well, Aguirre shares with other masterful movies the tension between a linear progressive journey and a spiraling downward. Indeed, Apocalypse Now seems inspired by some of Herzog's work in this film. Um, and incidentally, if you listen to the movie's German dialogue, it provides another layer of meaning. When the conquistador played by Klaus Kinski says, we need a leader using the word Führer the film becomes a post-war meditation on German guilt. He proclaims, we'll produce history as others produce plays. If the characters in this primordial landscape search for gold, it's power that Aguirre really seeks. Now, I'm just curious, how many of you have seen Heart of Dark, uh, have seen Apocalypse Now, rather? Uh, okay. Um, Yes, Andrea is quite right that Herzog seems fascinated by impossible missions and puts Kinski at the center of them. Why? Kinski's very bearing, his physicality, lends itself to the extremes like Strozek, no, and not, I'm, I'm sorry, Nosferatu and Strozek and Fitzcarraldo, um, the kind of incipient madness that you can feel lurking behind this man's eyes, those blue piercing eyes, makes him a perfect vessel for Herzog's vision. And as you probably know, they were very close and they also were like this. Uh, my Best Fiend, not friend, My Best Fiend is the name of a documentary that was made about Herzog and Kinski. Apparently they even pulled guns on each other while they were shooting. Um, but the collaboration was extremely fruitful. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about Apocalypse Now because it seems like a companion film, and then we'll take some questions and discussion. Um, I hope you all know that Coppola transposed Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness to the backdrop of the Vietnam War. The focus is on Willard, played by Martin Sheen, whose mission is to find the elusive Kurtz, played by Marlon Brando, in the jungle. 
the opening is anchored by superimposition. Different layers of reality exist simultaneously, external and internal. With the disorientation created by a face upside down, as well as in slow motion. You'll see how the music of the doors is hypnotic. The song, The End, not only identifies the time of the Vietnam War, but also creates a feeling of doom. Now, Selby, I think your screen sharing was slightly less problematic technically than Diana's. Should we try it again? Diana, no yeah, aspersion yeah. on you, just your, your technology. <laughs> It's, it's okay. the DRC, I guess, I guess the the DRC versus in, Milan. I guess the internet in uh, Italy is, is not as good as the internet in the Congo. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually surprised myself how it's okay. So I'm not going to deal with taxi driver today. There is not enough time. I'm just going to explain <laughs> that instead of a linear approach, Coppola creates again. Uh, I'm going to cut. <laughs> no more. Um, he creates these internal rhymes like Willard's face on the left and a totem on the right or a ceiling fan and helicopter blades. These circular images introduce one of the film's motifs. Apocalypse Now is not simply a voyage from civilization to the primitive jungle. In addition to a journey upstream, it's also a spiraling into madness. 
to quote Samuel Beckett's Endgame, the end is in the beginning. And he wrote that line long before Jim Morrison would sing, this is the end. Indy Coppola's decision to open the film with a song that announces this is the end adds a temporal dimension to the circularity. And the trance-like experience of the opening is enhanced by Coppola's choice of fading in and out rather than cutting. Uh, later in one of the most famous scenes from Apocalypse Now, music again provides a simultaneous emotional tone and a distancing from the action. The American helicopters over Vietnam are accompanied by Ride of the Valkyries, as Robert Duval's character Kilgore uses Wagner's music on loudspeakers to propel his men's attack. The music stops abruptly when we see Vietnamese children running from the men who are out to destroy them. So um, I'll just you know end the official part by saying that these movies brilliantly intertwine subjectivity, camera narration, sound design to create poetry as well as meaningful vision. Beginning with the opening sequence, these films gradually reveal their stories, utilizing the talents of cinematographers as well as composers. They engage us to look and listen more closely to how they unfold. But we have a few minutes for questions and comments, so please feel free. <laughs> you can either write it in the chat box or raise your hand electronically and uh, either on camera or off camera, feel free to uh, engage. Um, professor, um, I have to I have to go shortly uh, for another meeting, but I did want to mention um, Akira Kurosawa's movie uh, Dreams, which is I think five different vignettes of different almost poetry-esque uh, films somewhat reminds me of some of the films that you were selecting, even though that movie was uh, it said it was released in 1990. There seems to be some maybe correlation. I'm not sure if it's just in my head. Yeah, I, I think that ultimately, if you take 80% of the greatest filmmakers who've worked in the sound era, you will find overlaps in terms of how brilliantly they utilize the cinematic medium soundtrack as well as image. Look, for me, uh, Kurosawa is one of the true greats. Rashomon is a film that I invoke often in my classes. And it, it cinematic storytelling, the basic tools of it, it transcends time and place. It, it can be Japan, Iran, Poland, Italy, the United States. Um, I show films sometimes, I juxtapose in my classes, one week a film from Iran, the next week a film from Israel. Countries that are technically in warlike relations, their filmmakers overlap in terms of stories that ultimately tend to reinforce the humanity of characters rather than arbitrary political divisions. Oh, Claudia Myers, my former student, I remember Claudia with such affection, partly because she became one of the great filmmakers. I mean, Claudia, your own movies, as you know, I have been responding to with tremendous admiration. So thank you for being with us, even you know, if you have to leave soon. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people have to go. So it understood. Very good question for, for, for Annette. I'm gonna be very, um, <clears throat> how can I put it? Uh, unartistic um, by by suggesting that um, Bond movies initial scenes are very interesting sometimes um, and 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 I wonder whether you know, you have a view about that um, particularly one of the later ones that that has this Mexican um specter uh, yeah specter? probably yeah in 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 which again a, a view a a a, a, um, a touch of evil is is repeated uh in in a uh in in a scene which which is um you know no, no cuts no nothing just just uh if I'm One remembering second. correctly, Spectre, the film you're referring to, was directed by Sam Mendes. 
I'm almost positive. Who, did, who, who then did 1917. Exactly. And the cinematographer in both cases is Roger Deakins, D-E-A-K-I-N-S, one of the greatest cinematographers at work today. Um, you're bringing in an entire other area of discussion that I could spend a different hour on. And that has to do with the pre, the sort of prologues, what I would call opening sequences that are not necessarily part of the action, but that frame. Saul Bass was perhaps the greatest director of title sequences, credit sequences. You know his work from Psycho and Vertigo and um, uh, John Frankenheimer's Seconds, if I'm not mistaken. And oh, in my book, I mentioned the Betty Davis film, Storm Center. And the James Bond films have had the same kind of recognizable style, which has less to do with the director of a given film than the franchise. There's always the eye-catching um, circular imagery, usually of a gun and a female body I, conjoined. There's da-da, da-da, da-da-da. There's always the same music. So it's a way of eye-winking at the audience that they're going to re-enter a universe that they know from previous movies. But the one you mentioned, Spectre, I sort of sat up in my seat because I realized the virtuosity of the camera, which it does indeed allude to the opening shot of Orson Welles' Touch of Evil from the late 1950s, because of the continuous take, it's almost mind boggling that a camera could follow um, without cutting. There's a self-consciousness about it. Um, and isn't there a self-consciousness about all of the Bond films, especially when they open? Because we know that we're inside um, a fabricated universe that's very familiar to us. Thank you, Annette. Sure. Um, I think it's been it's been a wonderful uh, lecture, uh, a, a wonderful talk. Um, it just makes me, you know, want more. And and uh, we'll have to try. I'll have to try and reconnect with you and and find out how I can um, get back into into listening to your uh, wonderful uh, way of of describing movies. And, and your wonderful way of thinking, which is uh, uh, absolutely unique. Um, it, it brings me back fantastic memories of Yale, uh, some of the best uh, that I can, that I can uh, come up with. And, uh, you know, uh, memories which I've repeated uh, over time to, to many of my friends and encouraging them to, to, to go to movies together sometimes and, and mentioning you as uh, the, 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 the person who uh, injected the virus in me, uh, a, a certainly very positive virus in these days mm. of, of, <laughs> of much more negative ones. <laughs> for sure. So well, thank you very much, Annette, for, for um, uh, taking up this um, invitation. It was really extraordinary. Um, and uh, we very much look forward to uh, reconnecting sometime. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be in your company, albeit virtually. And uh, my 92nd Street Y classes and events are open to the public, and I believe it has international access. Uh, anyone can go to 92y.org, and my ongoing series is called Real Pieces, and that's open to the general public. Um, I've, I do interviews sometimes. We, we recently had Sofia Coppola when I interviewed her, not so recently, it was almost a year ago, um, that was open internationally. We had about 20, 30 countries represented. Um, and I have Sunday evening classes where students or participants watch a film and then I, <laughs> I do extended analysis, you know, for about an hour, including discussion. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, uh, thank that you would this. mean uh, that that would mean uh, three o'clock in the morning, probably for us, right? Ah, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I just realized that that is the issue. <laughs> that is yes. It would mean eight p.m. It would be two o'clock in the morning. I yeah, maybe not. Everything for art. Everything for art, Andrea. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Absolutely. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you, I'm afraid to leave, but have a good evening. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.
拜拜，拜拜。